Ethan Frome is a novel written in 1911 by a woman named Edith Wharton. Before we dive into this animated summary, here are some things to keep in mind. This is a beautiful piece of literature, but it's also depressing as hell, so trigger warning if you're in a dark place right now. Themes that come up in this novel are winter, societal expectations, morality, disability, escape, illness, and pickle dishes. I'll explain later. The story is told on three different timelines. The forward and conclusion are written in present day. Chapters 1 through 9, also known as the majority of the book, take place 20 years prior to that, over the course of four days. Throughout chapters 1 through 9, the main character reflects on things that happened a few days ago and has flashbacks to things that happened a few years ago. Also, the way Edith Wharton describes the landscape is reflective of the character's moods. Alright, you got this! Let's go! We open on a small fictional farm town called Starkfield, Massachusetts in the late 1800s slash early 1900s. Just looking at the name Starkfield, you already know this place sucks. Our narrator is an engineer who had to unexpectedly spend the winter in Starkfield on the way to a job site. He's staying in the widowed Mrs. Ned Hale, aka Ruth's house. One day at the town's post office, the narrator sees a striking, stoic, disfigured old man. He describes him by saying he looks as if he was dead and already in hell, and then asks a town person, who is he? The town's person's like, oh, that's just Ethan Frome, which is a crazy coincidence because that's also the name of the book. The town's person continues, oh, Ethan's just been that way ever since the smash up. At this point, you as the reader should be like, who is Ethan Frome and what the hell is the smash up? So back at Mrs. Ned Hale, aka Ruth's house, the narrator asks her about Ethan Frome. Mrs. Ned Hale, aka Ruth, who's normally a huge gossip, is surprisingly reticent. That means not revealing one's thoughts or feelings readily. I, of course, knew what it meant, but I just want to make sure you knew as well. That's a joke. I didn't know what it meant. The narrator pieces together that about 30 years ago, Ethan's dad got kicked in the head by the horse and went soft in the brains, then gave away all the family's money right before he died. Then Ethan's mom got sick and died too. Now Ethan's farm is pretty much bare and he's horribly disfigured from the smash up, whatever that is. Ethan's also been in Starkfield for quote, too many winters. Wow, I am so intrigued. Let's keep reading. A few more months of sucky winter in Starkfield pass and the narrator needs a ride to the train station but can't get one because all the horses in town are sick, which is weird. The only ride available in town, you guessed it, Ethan friggin' from. Ethan agrees to drive the narrator to and from the train station every day. During their rides, he never makes eye contact and only speaks in monosyllables. He is so mysterious. Then one day, the narrator notices his copy of Popular Science is missing. The next day, Ethan hands in the copy of Popular Science and says, you left this in the carriage. It's pretty obvious Ethan took the magazine and is now returning it. The narrator says, hey, Ethan, you can keep it. And he does. Aw, sweet. One day, coming back from the station, there's a really bad snowstorm and the narrator has to spend the night on Ethan's farm. They make it to Ethan's house, which is definitely not cottagecore. As they approach the door, the narrator can hear a woman's voice droning on querulously, aka whining. Ethan says, come in. The droning voice stops and then there are 44 ellipses. What a cliffhanger. So we're now in this part of the timeline, which is 20 years before the introduction. It's a snowy night and a young Ethan Frome waits outside the town church. The air is so still that Ethan compares it to an exhausted receiver, which is some type of physics thing you'd read about in, I don't know, popular science? Ethan knows about science things because a few years ago he studied physics at a nearby technical college but had to leave school and returned to the family farm when his dad died and his mom got sick. Ethan peeks into the well-lit church and sees everyone dancing, but he's really only watching Maddie. Sweet, sweet Maddie is dancing with Dennis Eddy, the son of Michael Eddy, a relatively well-to-do Irish grocer. Ethan is jealous and stares daggers at Dennis. Maddie is the cousin of Ethan's wife, Zena, aka Wicked Zena. Maddie's lived with him for the past year to help Zena take care of herself and the house. Zena sucks, and we'll get back to that later. Ethan likes having Maddie around because she's someone he can talk to. Ethan's a surprisingly sensitive soul and intellect. If he didn't have Maddie, he'd be alone on his farm with his evil wife, Zena. The highlight of Ethan's week is when he gets to take Maddie from the dance back to his farm. Recently, Zena's been extra critical of Maddie, so Ethan started helping Maddie with her chores to keep Zena off both of their backs. A doctor recently suggested that Zena get a full-time nurse. They won't be able to afford to keep a nurse and Maddie, so Maddie will have to go. Let's do a quick breakdown of what we know about Zena and why we hate her. She's really sickly and complains about it constantly. She's plotting to get rid of her own niece. She doesn't want Ethan to be happy. And I don't even know why Ethan married her in the first place. Ethan secretly loves Maddie. Zena openly hates Maddie. And everyone hates Zena, but is too scared to say anything. I'm definitely on team Ethan and you as the reader should be too. Okay, reflection over. We're back at the church where Ethan is adoringly watching Maddie dance. The church dance party ends and Ethan is waiting for Maddie behind a tree. Dennis Eddy offers her a ride home, but she says no thank you. Ethan is overjoyed that Maddie refused Dennis and comes out from his hiding spot behind the tree. Then they walk home together. During their walk home, Maddie tells Ethan that she does not want to get married and move out. This is important because it's when Ethan realizes that Maddie probably has feelings for him too. 
Back on the Frome property, they pass the tombstones of Ethan's parents. Ethan feels like the tombstones used to mock his desire for change and freedom, as if to say, we never got away, why should you? But now Ethan just thinks about how he'd like to live with Maddie forever, and when they die, they could be buried next to each other. Which sounds creepy, but is actually really romantic for late 1800 New England farm standards. As they approach the house, Ethan can picture his wife, Wicked Xena, asleep, snoring with her dentures in a glass by the bed. Let's add Toothless to Xena sucks bingo. They try to get in the house, but realize Xena played a trick on them by locking them out. They look around for the key, and finally Xena opens the door. This is the first time we really get a look at Xena, and let me tell you, she is terrifying. Xena says, I just felt so mean I couldn't sleep, which confirms that she locked them out on purpose. Ethan woefully says goodnight to Maddie and follows Xena to their bedroom. The next morning, Ethan is working in the fields, thinking about how he could have kissed sweet Maddie the night before. Maddie is the daughter of one of Zena's cousins. Her father was a crooked businessman in Connecticut, which is a state in the Northeast. When he died suddenly, it was revealed that the family actually had no money at all. He was a no good liar, just like the rest of the men in Connecticut. Maddie's mom died soon after, leaving Maddie a 20 year old orphan with barely $50 to her name. It was clear that Maddie couldn't survive on her own, so wicked Zena invited her to come to Starkfield to live with them and help with housework. Zena knew Maddie wasn't good at domestic chores, but she liked the idea of having someone else to complain about. After a few months in Starkfield, the fresh air and physical labor do Maddie good. Zena backs off a bit because she's busy dealing with her own complicated ailments. Back in present day, Ethan notes how everything feels like the calm before the storm. He returns home from the fields and sees Zena getting ready to go to a nearby town, Bettsbridge, to meet with a new doctor. Ethan is already excited about the prospect of having Xena out of the house and a day alone with Maddie. He says he can't take Xena to the train station because he has to pick up a payment for lumber, which is a total lie, but can you really blame him? The farmhand Jotham will take her instead. Ethan has a lot of real work he needs to do, but chose to lie instead. Make a mental note of this for later. This is when we learn that Ethan is 28 and Xena is seven years older than him. Even though she's only 35, which despite what Gen Z thinks is not old, her pale and wrinkly face and sickly nature make her seem like an old woman already. Zena leaves for the train station and Ethan goes back to work in the fields. He's daydreaming about coming home to Maddie and sitting by the fire together. Ethan reminisces how in college he came across as very reclusive, but was actually very sociable. After his dad died, Ethan was too busy to socialize. Then his mom fell ill and stopped talking altogether. As you can probably imagine, he started going crazy. Finally, Ethan's cousin, Zenoba Pierce, AKA Wicked Zena, came to help take care of his mother. Let's assume they're distant cousins. So Ethan's mom dies in the middle of winter and Zena gets ready to leave the farm. The idea of living alone in silence on the farm terrifies Ethan. So without thinking, he proposes to Zena. Upon reflection, Ethan realizes if his mom had died in spring, opposed to the dead of winter, he probably wouldn't have proposed to Zena. Ethan observes that Zena, quote, chose to look down on Starkfield, but she could not have lived in a place which looked down on her. After a year of marriage, Zena became very ill. Back in present day, Ethan meets with Andrew Hale. Andrew's building a house for his son, Ned, and his fiance, Ruth. Andrew says it seems like just yesterday that Ethan and Zena were newlyweds, which freaks Ethan out because it's been seven miserable years. Later on his way home, Ethan sees Ned and Ruth kissing in the woods. Back on the farm, Ethan passes by his parents' tombstones. Ethan wonders if the same thing will be written on his and Zena's tombstones when they die. Imagine you had to live on a stupid barren farm with your evil sickly wife and every day you pass a tombstone that literally has your name on it. I don't know about you, but I'm giving teen Ethan major sympathy points. Fast forward to Maddie and Ethan having dinner together in a bubble of domestic bliss. During dinner, the cat jumps up on the table, knocks over the red pickle dish, which shatters into a bunch of pieces. There is literally nothing sillier than a pickle dish, but this is a pivotal moment in the novel. It was a wedding gift that Zena hid with their other prized possessions. Obviously the pickle dish is symbolic of Zena and Ethan's marriage, but I don't need to tell you that. Remember, it was one of the major themes now not only does Maddie have to tell Zena she broke the pickle dish, but she also has to explain why she had it out in the first place, which was to have a nice dinner with Ethan. They both know they're doomed, but Ethan says he'll go into town tomorrow and get glue to put the dish back together. After dinner, Maddie and Ethan sit by the fire and chit chat. At first, Maddie sits in Zena's rocking chair, but then feels badly about it and moves. Ethan suggests they go sledding tomorrow and asks Maddie if she's brave enough to go down Corbury Road. Maddie comments how treacherous the hill is, but agrees to go. Ethan brings up how he saw Ruth and Ned kissing in the woods. This makes Maddie uncomfortable, which deters Ethan from caressing her hand like he had been hoping to. Ethan asks Maddie about when she'll get married and they revisit the fact that Zena openly wants Maddie to move out soon. Ethan then realizes that Zena will be back tomorrow and says the return to reality was as painful as the return to consciousness after taking an anesthetic. Ethan eventually kisses the cloth that Maddie has been working on sewing, which is weird, but there's just a lot of sexual tension. They say goodnight, and when Maddie goes up to bed, Ethan realizes that he never even touched her hand. Is emotional cheating just as bad as physical cheating? Take a moment to discuss. The next morning, Ethan thinks about how he feels so happy. 
He hopes to do his chores really quickly so he can run to the store, get glue, and fix the dang pickle dish before Xena comes back. But of course, everything goes wrong from the beginning, and on top of that, stupid Dennis Eddy's store is all out of glue. Ethan runs around town until he finally finds glue and then races home. As soon as he walks in the door, Maddie tells him that Xena's already home. Which is absolutely devastating news, God damn it! Ethan begs Jotham the farmhand to stay for dinner so Xena will be less of a bitch, but he refuses to stay, which is a really ominous sign. Let's do a quick recap. Ethan is a sensitive and intellectual man who dreamed of becoming an engineer but had to leave college early and return to his depressing family farm when his dad died and his mom got sick. His quote quote cousin came to take care of his mom and when she died Ethan panicked and married Xena who became sickly herself. Seven long years go by and sickly Xena's cousin sweet young Maddie comes to take care of her. Ethan loves Maddie, Maddie loves Ethan, and Xena is a total bitch. Back in present day, Xena just returned from out of town where she was visiting a doctor. Upstairs, Xena is telling Ethan how sick she really is. He feels compassion for her for a moment, and then she tells him that the doctor she saw suggests she get a full-time nurse. When Ethan starts complaining about their financial situation, Xena reminds him that she lost her health while taking care of his mother and that this is the least he can do for her. Xena says, what about that money you got from Ned Hale yesterday? But remember, that was a lie that Ethan told to avoid taking her to the train station. Their argument concludes when Ethan says, you're a poor man's wife, Xena, but I'll do the best I can for you. Then Xena says that Maddie needs to move out tomorrow because she already hired a full-time nurse who's coming the next day. This makes Ethan so mad and quotes, Ethan looked at her with loathing. She was no longer the listless creature who had lived at his side in a state of sullen self-absorption, but a mysterious alien presence, an evil energy secreted from the long years of silent brooding. End quote. Xena goes to sleep and Ethan goes to have dinner with Maddie. Maddie collapses in his arms and he finally takes his chance to kiss her. Quote, he had found her lips at last and was drinking unconscious of everything but the joy they gave him. Ethan tells Maddie that Xena wants her to leave. They both know that Maddie will probably have to resort to prostitution to support herself. Suddenly Ethan springs up and says, you can't go, Matt. I won't let you. She always had her way, but I mean to have mine now. That's when Xena shuffles into the room and sits down for dinner. During dinner, Xena is weirdly friendly to Maddie and keeps telling vivid descriptions of her intestinal disturbances. Gross. Put that in the Xena sucks bingo. Xena then goes to get some of her medication from a secret hiding place. She comes back with the broken pickle dish demanding to know what happened to her most prized possession. After she presses some more, Maddie confesses. Maddie says she just wanted to make the dinner table look pretty. Xena calls her a bad girl and says she always knew she was a bad girl because it runs in her family. Xena starts sobbing and holding the broken pickle dish quote, went out of the room as if she carried a dead body. In the opening of chapter eight, Ethan reflects on how when he first returned from college, he turned the side room in the sad farmhouse into his makeshift study. He usually can't use it in the winter because it's not heated. Ethan goes for his nightly walk around the house and when he returns to the kitchen, Maddie is gone, but there's a note from her that says, don't trouble Ethan. He takes the note to his cold study and reads it over. Quote, confused notions of rebellion stormed in him. He was too young, too strong, too full of the sap of living to submit so easily to the destruction of his hopes, end quote. Ethan recalls a man that he met once who ran away from his wife with his lover and all three of them were better off for it. Ethan starts thinking about running away with Maddie. He starts drafting a goodbye letter to Xena and brainstorming how he can possibly make this work. He then realizes how hopeless the situation is and quote, that there is no way out, none. He was a prisoner for life and now his one ray of light was about to be extinguished. He falls asleep in his study and in the morning wakes up to Maddie doing chores in the kitchen. Then, as a Hail Mary, Ethan decides to rush off to the Hale's house to ask for an advance on a payment so he may have enough money to run off with Maddie. But when he sees Mrs. Hale, she asks about Xena and says she doesn't know what Xena would do without him. Then she adds, quote, you've had an awful mean time, Ethan. The compassion that Mrs. Hale shows Ethan is huge because it makes him realize the gravity of what he's hoping to do. He then feels incredibly guilty about abandoning Xena as well as getting an advance from the Hales under a false pretense. Quote, the madness fell and he saw his life before him as it was. He was a poor man, the husband of a sickly woman whom his dissertation would leave alone and destitute, end quote. He can't take advantage of the Hale's sympathy and turns back to the farm empty handed. When Ethan comes home, he finds Zena in the kitchen reading a book called Kitty Troubles and Their Cure. Blech. Jotham is there for lunch and there's some back and forth about who's gonna take Maddie to the train station later that day. Zena insists that Ethan stay home, but he puts his foot down and says, no, I'm gonna take her to the train station. Once they're in the sleigh on the way to the train station, Ethan takes a detour around the scenic pond and they reminisce about a picnic they had there that summer. They mourn what could have been if they had acknowledged their feelings for each other sooner. Then Maddie pulls out of her pocket the letter to Zena that Ethan had drafted. Ethan proposes that before he drop her off at the train station, they go sledding down Corbury Hill, just like they had talked about. So they find a sled and go down the hill for fun. Then they both express how life will not be worth living without the other. Maddie says she wants Ethan to take her down the hill again, but this time hit the big elm tree at the bottom so they die together. They kiss once more and then Ethan insists on switching places with Maddie so he can feel her holding him before he dies. They go down the hill and a second before they hit the tree, Ethan sees a vision of Xena's face. This causes him to swerve and not hit the tree straight on. After the collision, AKA the smash up, Ethan has an out of body experience. He realizes he's in shooting pain. He can hear some sounds coming from Maddie as well as his horse in the distance. The chapter concludes with a bunch of dot, dot, dots. Ooh. If you remember 
from the introduction, we're going to jump back to present day, which means the early 1900s. In case you forgot, the narrator and old Ethan were coming home from the train station, but had to make a detour due to a snowstorm. As they approached Ethan's house, the narrator could hear a woman's voice droning on through the door. The narrator notes that the kitchen is run down, dirty, and cold. There are two gray-haired women. One is making dinner and the other is sitting in the corner by the fire. He immediately recognizes the woman by the fire's voice as the one he heard through the door. Ethan introduces the woman cooking dinner as his wife, Zena, and the woman sitting in the corner as, drum roll please, Miss Maddie Silver. Whoa, what, no way, that's so crazy. The next morning, the narrator returns to Mrs. Hale's house, who is shocked to hear he spent the night at the Fromes's. Mrs. Hale says she used to visit the Frome house quite frequently, but now finds it too depressing to go more than twice a year. She goes on to recount the horrible sledding accident, AKA the smash up, which disfigured Ethan and left Maddie almost completely paralyzed. Mrs. Hale admires Zena for graciously accepting Maddie back into her home and making a coincidental miraculous recovery from her own ailments just in time to nurse Ethan and Maddie. She continues to say for the past 20 plus years, they basically had no visitors except for the doctors and herself. The narrator thinks that Mrs. Hale's done talking, but then she leans in and shamefully admits that she thinks that Maddie would have been better off dying in the accident. The book concludes with Mrs. Hale saying, quote, I don't see there's much difference between the Fromes up at the farm and the Fromes down in the graveyard, except that down there, they're all quiet and the women have got to hold their tongues, end quote. The end. And yeah, that has been Ethan Frome by Edith Wharton. It is a beautiful novel, very well written, a quick read. I highly recommend it, but it is super depressing. This was written, animated, edited, and voiced over by me, Chloe. I'm a stand-up comedian and kind of a big nerd. Please subscribe to my channel if you want to see more of the eclectic things that I create. Thank you.